The Sports Walk is back. Watch season three of Backpack Broadcasting's original web series that brings you the opinions of real sports fans. The first two seasons and current season are available now for viewing on the Sports Walk YouTube channel and Facebook page. Check out the 2017 NYC WebFest official selection and see what other sports fans have to say on the hottest issues in sports today. It's easy. Just take the Sports Walk. Podcast episode 139, Dexter Henry, Brian Fonseca. You know the deal, quarantining in place, staying safe, doing what we have to do. Uh, but we are back. We are going to get into things very quickly today because there is a lot going on in the world of sports. We actually were going to go in a different direction for this episode, but we had to pivot because so much is going on. Uh, before we get into it, Brian, how you doing, man? You see the the Roy Jones Jr. background, and we're going to get into this later. I have a Roy Jones Jr. one. You have a Mike Tyson one. I don't have this. I'm going to say this on the front end. I don't have this because I'm necessarily rooting for Roy Jones Jr. in this fight. I have this because I want people to remember who he was just in the event if things go horribly, horribly wrong on September 12th, which is what we're going to talk about because I have a lot of concerns uh, for that fight. Well, and, 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 and boxing, in a way, can be a sort of theme for this episode of this podcast because I like to start off with a great quote, a quote that I absolutely, positively love. I apply to everything in my life, and I feel like more people should apply to things around this pandemic. And that quote comes from the guy that's behind me. If you're watching this podcast, Mike Tyson, uh, one of my favorite fighters growing up. And Mike Tyson famously said, had a quote that said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And sometimes, as we've learned in things throughout this COVID pandemic, some people don't have a plan. Some people don't want to act like they have a plan or their plan is shitty. And we've seen we've we've we we've, we've seen this happen time and time again. Now, I referred to this in the last couple of podcasts and I, again listening to this podcast, I would recommend anybody if you missed this podcast that we did a couple podcasts ago with our uh, colleague and friend, Jane McManus, a uh, columnist from the Daily News, wrote a great article weeks ago about why she thought sports should not return. And, and quoted Mike Tyson. I and think. quoted Mike Tyson in that too, yes. She quoted <laughs> in that episode. In that quote. episode, she quoted that. Yeah, and yeah. I think it's fair to bring it back to this to this episode. And at the time we are recording this, uh, as many people already know, sports fans that listen to this podcast, we have seen... Uh, the WNBA has returned in a bubble. Major League Baseball has returned uh, not in a bubble, and I had very much concerns about this. There still is a lot of chatter, Brian, about football and college football returning, which I think is even what? more ridiculous college. than baseball returning. Yeah, you should say like playoffs, college. Like it's yeah. <laughs> like it, it's it's crazy, right? And baseball at the time of us recording this podcast will be on its fourth night of play. Most teams have at least already played three games. And we have a situation. Things got real really quick. Now, before we get into all this and everything that's happened, uh, Brian, I don't know how you felt about baseball restarting in terms of the other sports. I think we all felt that sports probably shouldn't restart, but we thought the NBA had a better chance because they were in a bubble what were your thoughts on baseball in, in terms of the sport it is and possibly restarting? So I obviously knew sports were going to come back at some point. It was inevitable. And I wasn't totally against it because I understood it. And I understand even from the standpoint of a lot of the players wanted to come back. Now, the NBA, their plan seemed like it could work. As we've already seen, they've had some cases and now they have no cases as of recently where they tested 
a whole bunch of people. I don't remember what specific day it was, but they came back with no positive tests. They're enforcing the testing so much that Chris Porzingis forgot to get a test and didn't play the next game. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, they're taking this very seriously. The NBA and the WNBA have obviously sort of earned our trust as it relates to this thing. Basketball has always seemed to be ahead at the forefront of that regard, where the NBA, they're in a bubble, obviously, in Orlando. And um, the women are in IMG Academy, I think, in Bradenton, Florida. And their season started Saturday. I was watching some of those games before I had to, yep, you know, make them. Yeah, make some moves responsibly with a mask, of course, uh, social distancing and all that. But with Major League Baseball, um, when I heard that, because I, I was trying to figure this out, because I, you know, I was doing some research and this right before the season was starting, because it just kind of crept up on me. And then I was like, wait, so they're they're actually going to just be flying to Atlanta, Miami, New York. Toronto can't play in Canada because Canada's like, get the hell out of here. So they're going to play in Buffalo, which is obsessively the same thing. Um, <laughs> you know, Pittsburgh, and they're going to fl- they're just going to fly around and play, I guess, within their divisions. But they're still going to be flying. Now, granted, teams have private jets. So part of me is like, I mean, maybe this will work in some instances, but you're going to have a situation inevitably in a place like maybe Florida, maybe Arizona. But one of these... COVID hotbed places where there's going to be a lot of cases and we're seeing that now unsurprisingly with the Miami Marlins which you know bad things seem to happen to all the time but you know for it to happen so early in the season it obviously sucks for baseball but there's a lot of I told you so that people could say here being against like the plan because it didn't it didn't appear that MLB and you know football you know had, it doesn't appear that they have plans it doesn't appear that they really know what they're going to do, whereas the NBA, we were getting reports for a long time before they finally thought about something and was like, all right, we're going to do this bubble situation. It's going to be a campus. We're going to put this, 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 and this, and we're going to have – you know, like the NBA actually thought of something. The WNBA actually thought of something. Um, I don't really know how soccer is going. I haven't really followed the MLS much and how things are going on over there. I know internationally, though, they seem to be doing a pretty good job, from what I understand, in the Premier League and in Germany and in Italy, so on and so forth. But then again, those countries are just all doing a much better job of mitigating this virus than we are because we're still in the, like, the same position we were. Although not in New York City, but in some places in this country, we're in the same position, if not worse positions than before, basically. Yeah, well, this a lot of this upsets me, and a lot of it for me is absolutely I told you so. I mean, how did we think this was going to work? And I, I was talking with my my cousin who's a doctor uh, in Atlanta, and she's telling me about how the hospitals are slammed and everything down there. And we're all, she's also a big baseball fan, and we're talking about the Mets the other day and how we feel conflicted watching this because we know that these players might not be safe. One of the things she brought to me, somebody who studied medicine, is, you know, and she's not an epidemiologist, but studied medicine and said, hey, look, but these guys spend a lot of time in the clubhouse. They spend a lot of time in the dugout. I was, uh, the week before the season started, I was at City Field to watch a Mets workout and practice and inter-squad game. And I saw some of the things that was being done. And, and, and But yeah, I was like, yeah, the guys are still in the dugout. And that was a concern for, concern for me. So I'm not surprised at all this because while baseball is a sport, where Mm -hmm. most of the players went on the field, when you're playing defense and pitching, went on the field, yes, you can be socially Mm -hmm. distant. But in that dugout, Mm -hmm. in the clubhouse, a lot of time is together, traveling together, as you brought up, Brian. These were the concerns for me. Mm -hmm. Let's also give a shout-out to Canada. Shout-out to Canada (laughs) for doing the right thing by its citizens here. And not. let's just keep it real. With all this stuff around sports coming back in this country, it's been about the money. It's greed. Oh, a lot, gosh, yeah. a lot of these organizations have not shown to care about the health of the players. Now, the NBA has tried to do it the right way. Even Dr. Fauci has said, if you're going to try to bring sports back, this is the best way you can do it. Trying yeah. to do it in a bubble with the precautions that the NBA has done. A lot of people, from what you hear on the inside, colleagues you know who are down there are saying, hey, they're doing a good job. This is very strict. This is very thorough with what they're doing. Does that mean an outbreak can't happen? No. But what we're saying is, they tried to have something self-contained. Now, baseball couldn't do that because Florida and Arizona, the places where they have a lot of the stadiums for spring training, those are the places where lo- local government, governors there aren't doing the right thing. And citizens are protesting for their right to not wear masks. And a lot of people are in danger in those, in those states. So then with that being said, 
we can't be surprised at what we've seen in Miami and what we want to let people know with the Marlins, Miami Marlins, 13 of players, it's 11 players, two staff members have tested positive for the coronavirus. This is all within after their third game of the season. So then they had to cancel two games. The Marlins and Orioles were supposed to play in starting uh, Monday of this week when you're listening to this podcast down in Miami. That's that that game, the first game, which was supposed to be Monday, that's been canceled. The Yankees Phillies were all supposed to start a series in Philadelphia. That also has been canceled because the Phillies had recently played the Marlins. And I think it's interesting, Brian. We we don't know this yet at the time recording this podcast, although I've been looking for information and I haven't seen anything yet, is that how many Phillies players potentially could have been infected? The way you play teams, other teams so quickly in the MLB and the travel, as you mentioned, is what makes it dangerous. But kudos to the, the Blue Jays in Canada for saying no, well, really Canada and their Minister of Health for saying no, we're not going to have American teams where you guys are handling this virus horribly come into our country and have all this travel. They're gonna we're gonna put, and I'm paraquoting here, the safety of our citizens first. And that's exactly what what should be done. But a lot of this is I told you so. And now it's on Major League Baseball to say something. We have waited all day before we recorded this podcast on Monday, and we have heard nothing yet from Commissioner Rob Manfred. Nothing, <laughs> that's nothing, a good point. nothing at all what, so, so far. And that's absolutely despicable. And he has to speak. He's got to silence. There's a lot of critics around this. There's a lot of things going on. I want to, I want to read a tweet from David Price, a uh, pitcher for the Los Angeles Dodgers, who we all got to remember, decided not to play this season because he was concerned about his safety, because he didn't want to put himself at risk. And you know what David Price is sitting back and doing? I told you so. That's yeah. exactly that's exactly what he's doing. David Price had this to say. He said, now we really, in all caps, get to see if MLB is going to put players' health first. Remember when Manfred said players' health was paramount? Part of the reason I'm at home right now is because players' health wasn't being put first. I can see that hasn't changed. Hey, He's not wrong here. He's not wrong here at all. The problem here, Brian, in my opinion, and I wanted to, I had taken some notes on what the protocol was, just to be comparative in terms of Major League Baseball and why I have issues with it, right? Mm -hmm. So just so everybody knows, players in Major League Baseball, they're tested for the virus every other day during the regular season. Tests will be run in saliva collections. Though there will be instances in which nasal or oral swabs could be used, players and staff will undergo symptom screens and temperature checks at least twice a day during the season. People will be given a thermometer to check their temperatures every morning. The temperature threshold is 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Here's my other part. And this is the thing I worried, I wondered about, and I didn't know, but I had to look up earlier today. There's no official restrictions on what players are allowed to do away from stadiums. But the Major League Baseball says individuals must, quote, ensure they all, excuse me, ensure they all act responsibly. It's not good enough. No, it's not, it's not good, good enough. enough. What it's we, not good enough. We all went to school. You know what I mean? Like, we were told you have to follow these certain rules that didn't do them in high school. You don't just grow out of that because you become an adult. And a lot of these guys are in their 20s. You think they're going to follow a bunch of rules just because you said so? Like, no. Also, we, we, we can look we can look as far as the states where people, where these numbers have gone up. You know why they're going up? Because people couldn't follow the rules when you left it up to them on their own. You yeah. People couldn't simply say, hey, you know what? Put on a mask to keep other people safe. Look at the states, Arizona, Georgia, Florida, and ask yourself what the people are doing there when left up onto their own by local governments, right? N- nothing. N- they're not doing it. No, I cannot trust and ensure that people are going to do the right thing in a pandemic. If, if anything we've learned from the pandemic, it's that. We can't, yeah. ensure, we can't ensure that. And my problem, Brian, with Major League Baseball before we move on is it's not enough to just test, right? It's not enough to just when you find out somebody has this disease to then quarantine them. That's all reactive. How are you being proactive? It's fair to question, has Major League Baseball been proactive at all in this? What have they really been doing to protect the players, right? Some people will say, well, they're doing some of the stuff you said before. That's all testing. 
You got to prevent people from being able to get it. It does matter what they do when they leave the ballpark. These men, some of them go home to girlfriends, wives, kids, moms, dads, whoever. Wives. Mo- yeah. what, a, what a mistresses, whoever <laughs> they're seeing, right? You don't know where they're going. You're just going to ensure that they do the right thing. You don't know if some person, when they go to Atlanta or Chicago, wherever, Milwaukee, wherever, I mean, how they're moving in those spaces or what they're doing. And then they come back into the clubhouse. And let's say Brian's my teammate. And Brian's been the one who's been chilling in his room, playing his PlayStation, not going out there and really trying to stay safe and socially distant. But I'm the person that's been hitting the town. Still trying to hit these bars. Still trying to see what the action is down on whatever street. Yeah. And now I bring something back to you. How am I, I, I'm responsible for that. And it is responsible yeah. on the, the leadership of the MLB to protect the players. And they haven't done this. Now, I understand why they couldn't have a bubble because Florida and Arizona. But at the same time, where has Major League Baseball been proactive? Please show me. Please show me where they've been proactive and taking care of the players who, for a majority of time during a game, are pretty tight. I know they've expanded the the dugouts and built things along the first and third baseline so players can go into, but the players are still too close. It's just still too much. They spend a lot of time in the clubhouse, as I said. I told you so. Now, baseball has gotten punched in the face. Yeah. And, And in my opinion, they didn't really have a plan. Yeah. I agree. I, I have nothing else to add. I don't. I, I if you ask me if we're going to see playoffs or a World Series, I don't think we're probably going to see any of that this year. You know what I mean? At this rate, I have no idea what's going to happen because again, Rob Manfred is out here trying to get this money, so we really don't know. But it's 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 probably likely that we see baseball stop in August or something like that if they even want to get that far. But I don't know because I, I don't I, I don't know because greed is obviously run rampant on this country i actually thought of something that i'm gonna have for my one time for your mind later surrounding that but yeah i just don't know what's to sort of predict but yeah this is an i told you so moment for baseball and you know we're gonna be watching the nfl very closely because they're gonna be up to bat soon and they don't seem to have much of a plan either and the players do want to play but they also want to ensure that the nfl is taking the proper precautions like the nba is at least trying to do well, you want to talk about getting punched in the face if they try to play. I, you can guarantee they'll really get punched in the face. That's another topic we're going to get to into into at a later podcast. But I have no idea how they, of all sports, football of all sports, can 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 get this done. Traveling with this is dangerous, folks. Um, I have limited my travel for work, so I want to put myself out there on that. I have no instance of traveling anytime soon. No desire to want to travel like that anytime soon to put myself more at risk, especially coming from New York. And it's not yeah. fair for me to put other people at risk because it's not just about what I can catch, but it's about what I even asymptomatically potentially can spread. And yeah, so that, that's my bigger concern, too, because, yeah, because we're, we're, we're honestly very lucky that the death toll has gotten like it, it, the death rate rather not the death toll, but the death rate is actually not as high as it could be or once was. It appears. So we're actually very lucky for that because this could obviously even be a lot worse than it is, but it's still shitty. <laughs> it was still bad. Yeah, man. You know it, I mean? it, it is. Look, you got to have a plan. Right now, baseball to punch in the face. We'll see what they're going to do. Hey, everybody. Brian Fonseca here to tell you about the multi-time award-winning series Out Now that is Side Hustle, which is created, executive produced, hosted, and edited by me, Brian Fonseca. Side Hustle is a sit-down interview series that taps into sacrifice, the odd avenues taken to progress closer to your ultimate dreams, and some jokes as well. Because, you know, we always got to find funny and we always got to find time to laugh. Side Hustle has been named to the best TV and web series category at several different film festivals, including the 2020 International New York Film Festival, the New York Movie Awards, and a host of others. Be sure to watch season one in full right now on either BrianFonseca.net or YouTube.com slash BrianFonseca. Brian with a Y, remember. All eight episodes, trailers, teasers, and promo are free to watch, and the series as a whole is approximately two hours long. Everyone has a story. Everyone has a side hustle. Be sure to watch Season 1, out now. Speaking of getting punched in the face. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Brian, Brian, Brian with the segue. (laughs) 
Oh my God, I'm not happy about this, Dexter. But we're we're gonna introduce you. You're not you're um, not happy. What a shock! It's one of my. No, let's not do that. <laughs> he's always he's what always I, he's always miserable. People. No, I'm joking. I'm 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 completely joking. I love boxing as a discipline. No, 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 no. Not as a business. You, you, you meant to, you meant another word there that starts with the letter V instead of boxing. Violence. Yeah, violence. <laughs> violence. Okay, I enjoy violence as a discipline. <laughs> there we go. There we as go. Practice. No, 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 you know what I mean? Because look, again, sometimes, sometimes it is the answer for certain things. But we don't have to get into that because that could be a whole dangerous subject, and it could also be a very lighthearted subject. But neither, neither. I mean, we, we, talk, we talked about people getting punched in the face already in this podcast, so it, it all works. It all works. But go ahead. Mike Tyson, who has not boxed a professional fight in 15 years since his loss, his humiliating loss, where he quit against Kevin McBride and Roy Jones Jr., who last fought actually only a few years ago, a couple years ago, rather, in 2018, two and a half years ago. But that was against a dude named Scott Sigmund, who was 30 and 11, whatever, whatever. He, you know, he demonstrated that he could beat up a bunch of jobbers at the latter portion of his career, but he ceased to be Roy Jones Jr. of old. They are fighting against each other, Mike Tyson and Roy Jones Jr., September 12th. There's an official promo for this. This is on Mike Tyson's, I think, uh, Fist for Legends or Legendary Boxing or whatever it's called. Uh, it honestly doesn't matter because that's all you need to know is that it's not with Top Rank or one of these major you know, organizations. That none, you know, none of them are sanctioning it. So you have Mike Tyson versus Roy Jones Jr. There's an official promo. They're calling it an eight-round exhibition. I don't know about you. I understand scrimmages in basketball. I understand exhibitions in baseball, like, you know, after three innings, you take out your starters or five or six innings or whatever the case may be. In basketball, we're seeing now with exhibition games in the NBA, uh, guys aren't playing fourth quarters. You don't exhibition boxing, all right? Like, you, you, you're, there's still punches to the face. Like, maybe it's an exhibition because they wear headgear, but that's not something that you could just flat out call a scrimmage. They're fighting on September 12th. Um, Eight-round exhibition is what they're calling it. Mike Tyson, again, who has not fought in 15 years, but looks to be in amazing shape for somebody who is, I believe, 54 years old now and has a pretty good podcast. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, uh, Hot Boxing with Mike Tyson, but it's it's interesting because I've heard him on there talk about, like, he's at peace now, he smokes a lot of weed, he's tranquil, this, this, and that, but at the same time, like, there's been times where he feels like he needs to release that that sort of inner inner dog that he still has in him after all these years. And Roy Jones Jr., who really totally honestly should have stopped boxing 11 years ago professionally. He hasn't had a great showing since he fought Jeff Lacey 11 years ago, almost to the day, August 15, 2009. Jeff Lacey, who was a contender at the time, and he just outboxed him silly. And then after that, he was knocked out by Danny Green, Roy Jones Jr., that is. Danny Green, not the basketball player, but some dude from Australia. Uh, He lost by decision to Bernard Hopkins, who was already almost 50 years old at that time. And then he lost to a knockout by Dennis Lebedev. One of those was in the first round. And the thing with Roy Jones Jr. is that he also he, when he gets knocked out, he doesn't just get knocked out. <laughs> like, he looks like he's going to die sometimes. Like, the Antonio Tarver one was bad. Oh, yeah. I'm a, yeah. The Enzo, Enzo Macchiarelli one was really bad. That's the one from a few years ago that went viral where you could hear his head. It sounded... It sounded like you smacked someone's 40-inch ass. Like, it was so loud, and you just heard it reverberate. I haven't done that, but okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then the other knockouts where he just hits the back of his head on concrete. Like, I have a lot of concerns. Mike Tyson, obviously, naturally bigger. Roy Jones Jr., his whole thing is his speed and his natural ability. But you're 51 years old now, dude, and you've been knocked out five times. Like, that's serious, and I just – I don't want to see it personally. I'm going to see it, but I'm going to be wincing the entire time. Why? Why why are you going to watch this? Why? Be- because it's just what like I'm a boxing guy. You know what I mean? I, I like, feel like I, I, I feel like I have to see what's going on. You don't. If I'm going to be informed about like cuz we're going to talk about it. I'm sure we're going to talk about Here's it after the thing. I'm not going to watch it. I'm I'm, I'm I am not supporting that nonsense. You, you think you're going to – because think about it. What, what else are you going to watch? There ain't going to be no college football that day. <laughs> That's cool, man. I'll find, I'll, probably won't be no baseball. <laughs> I don't watch college football like that anyway. Uh, probably won't be any baseball because I'll probably get shut down. 
the NBA probably will hopefully will still be going on. The WNBA will still be going on. I this to me, I'm so see that's my problem, Ryan. If you're so disappointed, don't support it. Don't support this nonsense. You don't have to look at the train wreck. This is a train wreck. This is Mike Tyson, who I love from Brooklyn. Love the quote, all that stuff. Great fighter. Roy Jones was a great fighter. Uh, one time ran in there. Honestly, one, honestly, Roy Jones Jr. to me, the second best athlete of the 1990s. Great. To me. Yeah, right dude, after Michael Jordan, obviously. Went too long in fighting. So my thing is, like, Mike Tyson can talk about, and I don't want to talk about people's feelings, but he still feels the need to get that that hunger, that tiger out, whatever. He's got to get out of himself. And I understand that. I'm like, yo, man, you could just go punch the bag, some bags on See, that. You don't have – and here's my th- – This is the, you know me. I always ask this question. I always ask this question around things that happen that become spectacles. Who wanted this? Who wanted to see this? Who yeah. was who was sitting around saying, you know what, you know, be great, man. You know what I want to see? Mike Tyson at this age versus Roy Jones Jr. We yeah. don't – and boxing fans, boxing fans, you can be better than this. You don't have to watch this. They don't have to. They don't have to give you this shit, and you have to accept it and say that it's good because we know it's crap. You know that this is crap. You know this isn't good boxing, and this is a problem with the boxing industry. We rarely ever get the fights that you want, and then people have this thing about trying to make them when these dudes are be well past their prime. Does any of us want to watch athletes well past their prime play? What's next? We're going to watch Michael Jordan and Charles Barkley play one on one? No, I don't want to see that. Why I... do you want Now, granted, that would be, be <laughs> that would be better. It would be it's, it's Charles good. Barkley probably wouldn't have been the guy I would have used there, you know? What but saying? I just I just look, it would be better, but I still don't want to see it, man. And we, yeah. the thing about watching these athletes is you like watching these athletes when they're in their prime and they're great. And I want to still remember them, remember them like that. And like Brian said, that's why Brian has a picture up of Roy Jones behind him for this podcast. And I got a picture up of the great Iron Mike Tyson behind me for this podcast. So you can remember them how they were. You don't have to see this of them in the beyond. This is not even the twilight of the career. It's over. The careers yeah. <laughs> are over. You don't need to see them in a ring anymore. And so I'm going to call shame on you, Brian. Shame on all the boxing things out there that are going to do it. They're going to tune in. I, have six I hope you change your mind in six I have, weeks. I have six weeks. Uh, cause, cause, look, do you I'm think you're going to be entertained? I'm a, I'm do you, th- do you think guy. you're going to be entertained? No, I think I'm going to be repulsed the whole time, man. So you, because, so you, because I'm looking at it, I'm like, with me, it's more so Roy Jones Jr. than Mike Tyson. I think it, maybe it's because Mike Tyson appears to be in physical shape. And honestly, like, while he's been stopped and knocked out, it was never like the way Roy Jones Jr. has been knocked out. And that's my biggest concern here. Because I've seen him take a big shot, yes. land his head, thump on the canvas, and just not wake up for an extended period of time. And this is somebody who at one point in my life was the best athlete I've probably ever seen. Let me ask you a couple, a couple questions of things I do not know on this. That I This is serious questions. Okay, first question number one. How much are these guys getting paid? Has that been disclosed? Oh, I don't know. We have no idea how these guys paid. No. We know no. they're doing this for the money. Two, um, where is this being broadcast? Because you said you're going to watch it. Who's broadcasting this? And is this pay-per-view? Because if it's pay-per-view, God bless you folks who are going to pay money. Brian, you don't have to talk about the ways that you will see it. I understand that. We won't <laughs> talk about that here. But the folks that are going to pay money, God bless you. Is this pay-per-view? I can't hear you, Brian. Your mic, your mic went out. There you go. You're back. That hasn't happened in a while, actually. It has not. I've usually been better about this. Um, either that, or some of our episodes have been a little bit morbid. Um, so, <laughs> no, but that's not true. So, uh, they're actually doing this in Carson, California, which is uh, interesting. That's that's where a lot of big fights have gone down. Mm-hmm. Um, Ruslan Provodnikov and Timothy Bradley being one of the best ones. Um, there is supposed to be a 10 part docu series leading up to the bout by a platform called Triller, T R I L L E R. <laughs> Shout out to them for getting that gig to shoot it. Not mad at them. Part docu series. I mean, look, if they approach Backpack Broadcasting to do that, I don't I'm think I'm shooting it. You as, know, yeah. as, as, as stupid as I think it is, I'm shooting it. You know why? 
I hope you. I would see then. I'd hope people watch it. I just hope you watch the docu series. That's it. Just watch the docu series. I'm interested in that. I'm interested in the docu series. I legitimately am. Now, if I have to pay for it to watch it, I'm not going to watch I'm not, it. I'm, I'm, I'm not supporting any of this. I do want to. I do want to see. You know what else worried me too? What else worried me too is just watching the footage or whatever. Just Tyson just looks better. You know what I mean? He just looks sharper. And I look at him being like, I know he hasn't been knocked out in a long time. And Roy Jones Jr. is already pitting himself as an underdog. He's like, look, man, all I got is God on my side. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, dude, you're Roy Jones. Like, you shouldn't, you know, like, you're you're Roy Jones. Except you're- he's not that guy anymore. Neither is Tyson. And maybe maybe Roy Jones is acknowledging that he knows. Well, Roy Jones better know he's not that guy anymore after the way he's been knocked out the last couple of times he stepped in the ring. I hope he would know that. Roy Jones Jr. last month. Uh, said that I've been trying to enjoy retirement, but people don't seem to want to let me retire. They keep calling me back that Mike wants to come back. They keep telling me that and that I'd be a great opponent for Mike Tyson. I don't know if I buy that, though. <laughs> Look, Roy, Roy Jones, why don't you just we be, always a, be honest, will. man. You you know what the bag is, and you want to get that bag. That's we what always, it's about. We always wanted to see it, but I would have preferred it back then. <laughs> Shit. Me too. We're about 2020. We're about 2018 years late on this one. Uh, Tyson is a hell of a specimen still. Uh, still a problem to deal with, but at the same time, life is life. You only live once, not according to Freddie Gibbs. Uh, you want to know what it's like. You go in there, you see it, you still got to see it. Yeah, you also, still, you go. You also no, can you still go. get knocked out. You don't have I, to see it. I disagree. I disagree. You don't have to see it. You know what I mean? Like, there are certain things that as you're growing up, you kind of know, like, how you feel about certain things, what you like, what you don't like, whatever the case may be, certain foods or whatever. Like, no. Nah. There are certain things that I could see that I don't need to try in order to like it or not like it. Like, I'm probably never going to go horse racing in my life. You wow, know what man. I mean? Wait, go to a horse race or go on a race on a horse? On, on like, on the – like, be a disc jockey. Why would you, you know not, what I'm Why would you not race on a horse? You, you kind of have the hype for it. Because I have balls, like legitimately, that would hurt. You know what I'm saying? No, like, you, not, not, they 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 protect that. You'll be okay. You'll be okay. I'm also too. I'm too big for that. You're too heavy for it. You absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like you not to say, like you know, I'm I'm a, I'm good. I'm in shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you got you got to be like like I'm, I met Victor Espinoza that trainer a couple of years ago, and like he's a short dude. It's crazy because like his upper body, he's like in shape, but he's a yeah. light. He's a lighter dude. They're like you know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 like, yeah, 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 yeah. He's in shape. He's an in shape guy. But like, he was so a there's a weight class for that stuff. But yeah, back to the uh, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm yeah. Well, I, well to your point, I have a thing to your point though. You talked about how you don't need to see something to know you you want experience or not. Here's the here's the problem with this. Roy Jones has been knocked out. He's experienced yeah. this multiple times. Really bad. It's not out the realm of possibility. If I think that's what you're saying, Brian, that Tyson could knock him out here. I agree with you. That I think could happen. That's the general expectation. And that's could what it, everybody thinks. and could it look bad? Sure. Am I dying to watch this to see this? No, because I feel like if I support this, and this allows the circus of these events to continuously come up in boxing with boxers past their prime, and we as boxing fans tend to accept this and still watch this, and we have to stop and say no. Enough is enough. Because you know who doesn't does, doesn't do this, and I don't even like their product, not because they're a bad product, but just because I don't get down really with the sport. MMA and the UFC. You know all about the MMA and the UFC that I respect, even though I don't watch the sport? People get the fights they want to see. People get to see the matches you want to see. And you know the names because they do a way better job of marketing their stars. Boxing, please wake up for this, that in 2020, we are still allowing, and this might be the biggest name fight of the year, even though I think the best fight of the year will be upcoming, Tiafimo Lopez and um, yes. Lomachenko. But, yeah. any, but beyond that, we are still looking at this as this is something that could be sold that will really get people to want to watch. And that's why I'm saying shame on you boxing fans that are going to support this and watch this because this is why they keep giving us shitty stuff. New podcast alert. Life coaches Marguerite Pierce and Lindsay Jackson are bringing a rich blend of laughter, love, and wisdom to their podcast, Necessity. The pod seeks to reestablish the basic tenets of self-love self-confidence, goal accomplishment, and the ability to love life on your own terms. Necessity is available on all major podcast platforms, so grab a cup and listen up as two coaches are on a mission to shift perspective one sip at a time. 
let's wrap it up and get it to the NBA and get it to at least something happy on this show. Well, because- well, well. I mean, yeah, something happy. I mean, we said Roy Jones and not seem to have a plan, even though he's been punched in the face. The NBA and WNBA seemed to somewhat have plans uh, starting up their seasons and doing it in a bubble, as Brian had mentioned earlier in the podcast. Uh, how excited are you? WNBA started already. We watched some of the games. Um, I checked out Ionescu's de- debut. Um, I checked out what other game did I watch? Watched another game. And, you know, I- I'm excited to see basketball back. Everybody knows I love basketball. It's my favorite sport. How excited are you about the NBA uh, this coming, you know, this later this week, the startup? How excited are you for it? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm actually watched, I've watched less NBA games than I thought I would. <clears throat> and I'm actually, maybe I shouldn't be, but I'm a little bit surprised at how much people are tweeting about them. But I think it's just because they're deprived and haven't seen anything for so long. But for me, I'm like, there's, there's scrimmages. So I'm not really trying to pay that much attention to it. You know, I have like stuff that I'm working on that's sort of like takes me away from watching certain games especially like during the day so it's like i i've haven't been watching that much i've seen the nets a little bit i've seen the lakers a little bit i've seen the clippers a little bit i've caught <clears throat> miami obviously i've caught just about every team a little bit but i haven't watched like super extensively or thoroughly or anything like that for me the real stuff quote unquote doesn't even begin this week i'm gonna wake up when the playoffs get here because even before we get to that point we still have eight games to get to for the teams or whatever and i'm definitely gonna be watching but i'm actually gonna be paying closer attention you know as we progress but you know guys look good guys like they've been ready to play uh i don't mind the empty arena stuff at all um you know i I would, you know, I, I'm I'm excited and looking forward to the day where yes, we can safely be in arenas and amongst each other and crowds and things of that nature. But to be honest with you, I've been enjoying, for example, UFC with no fans. Bellator just came back, no fans. Obviously, they're doing their stuff in Connecticut or did their stuff in Connecticut recently, um, and they're gonna go back there. The NBA with no fans and players just talking, you know, I I didn't love that in one game in particular they had the announcers on Zoom. And, like, they didn't have mics, it appeared, mm. or cameras. Like, it was mm. interesting. I think it was a Denver Nuggets broadcast. So, yeah. But, you know, overall, I'm happy to see that the NBA is back. And I'm happy to see the WNBA is back. I watched pretty much the entire Liberty and Seattle Storm game, the first game of the season. Um, I wanted to see uh, Phoenix play, but I missed that because I think that they're actually going to be really, really good. They got Bria Hartley backing up now, and Skyler Diggins is there, and Diana Taurasi. They have a very interesting team, but, you know, New York is young, and with Seattle, it was great to see Brianna Stewart back because she had the serious Achilles injury, and she's back, and she was tearing shit up on Saturday. Yeah, so, she, she was good. good. She shot the ball well. I feel a lot more confident about both those leagues being able to finish seasons and have champions and all those things and progress forward than I do about the other leagues. Like yeah. for basketball, I feel good about saying like, yeah, we'll see this play through. I, I, I do too. I feel better about basketball. I feel better about it than I did a month ago. Um, I'm still always concerned about the players' safety. I am still have concerns about that. And I'm not necessarily sure they should have played. But now that it's here and I've seen what the NBA has done, I've warmed up a little bit to it more. As a basketball fan, as I said, I love it. I'm going to be watching it. I will be there Thursday night watching the first couple of games and watching throughout. Um, it's just, yeah, I'm just really excited. And I think, you know, what you see around the game, you talked about the presentation, Brian, the fans not being there. From what I've watched, I haven't watched as many scrimmages as you probably have. I probably only checked in on about three and watched maybe 10 minutes of each. But... Um, from what I see, it looks fine. It didn't bother me. The crowd wasn't there. Um, I even watched a couple weeks ago the basketball tournament. I was checking into some of that, and without a crowd, that was fine. Obviously, yeah. the stakes are not as big. It, it, it somewhat it can feel like summer league, but I think once you it see does. the playoffs start and the intensity ratchet up, I don't even think you're gonna really no- you're gonna start to notice it or n- really notice it or not become used to it. I think in sports like baseball and football, it's way more noticeable, um, and maybe a lot of that has to do with some of what Brian and I've done in our careers, we've probably been in gyms where there hasn't been that many people for a game, or played school, or played in summer. high school in front of your stuff yeah. where there hasn't been that many people for a game. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's 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 not that bad. It's kind of just being there and experiencing the basketball. Um, so I, I I I'm in it now. Does this change anything for you in terms of the NBA before we wrap up? Um, I too also I want to say WNBA too. I am very intrigued in watching Phoenix. I wanted to watch them. I have not got to see a game of theirs yet. There's a couple on TV this week I want to catch. 
Um, they're going to be really interesting to watch. Uh, in terms of the NBA, has this changed anything for you on who you think can win, take it all? Are you still uh, a believer that Miami can uh, mess things up it, 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 in the East? Uh, yeah. Has anything changed for you from before the season? You know, that, that before the season halted on March 11th, has anything changed? I'm not sure who this hurts necessarily, but I think it helps Philly because Ben Simmons appears to be playing a little bit better. I don't know if we're going to get fooled again, but, you know, they've had time to sort of, I guess, get their shit together. Uh, Miami, when the season ended, they were pretty banged up. Tyler Hero was out. Myers Leonard was out, who's actually a pretty big part of what they do. And Andre Iguodala has been there a little bit more, so they've had time to, like, practice, like, actually practice leading up to all this. And Jay Crowder and Solomon Hill, like, they have guys that I think are going to actually help them. Boston... Kemba Walker was fucked up, like, when, when mm-hmm. the season ended before. His ankle was messed up. He had a string of, like, really, like, not Kemba-like performances. And he, he apparently he was still struggling with that not too long ago. But now he's getting back into the swing of things as well. So, you know, what I like is that we've, we've been able to see that teams have been able to get back healthy. And what I also appreciate, and this, is, this was a concern of like yours and a lot of other people, was are they going to continue keeping their foot on the gas as it relates to protesting and trying to raise awareness for social change and social causes? And they're not backing away from that, especially the WNBA. But the NBA, like, no, I don't think anybody's going to back away from that. I don't think people are going to as well. I think people can focus on like multiple things at a time, even though <laughs> some people probably can't because they're you know, stupid, but like, I think we're going to see, we're going to see that continue to be pushed to the forefront. The WNBA has been doing it for a very long time and they've been very proactive as it relates to that. Um, team stayed in the locker room during the national anthem, uh, the Liberty and the Seattle storm did on Saturday. Uh, that's something that I used to do at a place we both worked at. I think it's fair to ask why they still playing the national anthem, but that's a whole nother thing. Well, yeah. We talked about that yeah. a couple podcasts ago. It's yep. the dumbest tradition that we have in all the sports, but you know, I think that we're going to see the best of both best of both worlds. I think we're going to see really good basketball down the stretch, and we're also going to continue to see this push for social change. And you know, hopefully, we continue to get the best of both worlds in that regard. Well, and things and who, actually. Happen. And who did you have winning it? Oh. For the NBA, um, I, I I'm not going to move off the Lakers. I'm yeah, we, oh, we both had the Lakers. Lakers, so we both we both had the Lakers. I still think mm-hmm. the Lakers are going to get it done. Um. WNBA is too early for me to tell. Yeah, I can't but, tell yet. Well, right, I, I put my but, money on Phoenix, but yeah, I, it's, I might, yeah. But it's still it's still too early to tell. I still think the Lakers can get it done. I am more of, and I do think a break helped your your Miami Heat. I guess I call it your Miami Heat. <laughs> I do think it helps them in a way because I think you made some great points about getting some of the guys that got from the trade, Andre Iguodala and others, to help rest up, get healthy. It seemed like they were getting a little bit tired and they were kind of playing 500 ball before yeah. the season stopped. They had the worst loss of the season the day the season stopped. Stopped. But the thing, here's the thing, and you, you, I'll give you credit because you said this from, I don't even know, December, we're talking about <laughs> last year, when the world was different. Brian yeah. said, hey, I think, I remember Brian called me, he told me, he said, I think Miami can give Milwaukee some trouble. Yeah. I think they can make that series a lot more difficult. I believe that's what you said than people think. And I remember the last time they played the Bucks, I was impressed because I watched that game and I really loved what Bam did against Giannis. And he's, he's back not, now too. He's back now too, and he's healthy, and he's he's got the length and the strength that can really bother Giannis. He's not going to stop him, but he can slow him down a little bit. And I think that could be an X factor. If you get Giannis frustrated and these other guys around him, we'll get more into this down the road as we get to the playoffs, can't make shots. Woo! Woo! Miami. Yeah. I can see the confidence growing for Miami. They're underdogs. They're that kind of scrappy team that Brian likes and doesn't give a damn about what anybody else to say. They're led by Jimmy Butler, who Brian loves. I like Jimmy Butler, too. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I... And I- you know what? It's funny that you mentioned that too. Last thing for me on the, I I wish that the NBA would have let Jimmy Butler uh keep his because he wanted to wear no name yeah on the back. I, of his I was uniform. really in support of that man. Yeah, and he so it, when I first heard it, I was like, wait, 
what? Like I, I like I didn't quite understand it right away. I heard his explanation three different times because I didn't understand. Like I had to like just keep replaying it, and then it hit me. I was like, oh, that makes so much sense. Like it was super profound. And then there was like 20, 25 other players reportedly like wanted to do the same thing after that because this whole thing was like, yo, if I'm not Jimmy Butler, who I am today, I'm just another dude. Like I'm just another that black be, that man. That could be died. You know right. And I loved it. I loved the statement he was trying to make. I wish he had done it. Uh, last thing for me on the NBA, uh, I did like the Knicks hiring of Tom Thibodeau. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, oh, yeah, I, we're gonna get into this yeah, more than another play next pod. I know there's some Knicks fans out there who didn't like it, but there's some Knicks fans, no matter what you say, they're gonna cry about anything. And I was talking with one uh friend fan of a uh, Nick fan of mine and he wanted Kenny Atkinson over Thibodeau and was like Thibodeau's too many That's questions. The only other guy I would have probably said to him. I find it's not it's not impossible that Kenny Atkinson can still be on that staff as a lead assistant. It's very that's very possible and much in play. And yes. You know, every coach, unless you're Doc Rivers, Popovich, uh, I don't even know. That's probably really it. I'm talking about in the league. Every coach Spoke. out there, Spo, maybe another person I add. Kerr, Carl, Kerr, Kerr, and Carl, Kerr, Carl, I'll probably add those guys. Yeah. Most of these other guys have question marks if you were going to hire them, right? Sure. Like this, this, this is just what it is and how it's going to do. There's no coach you're going to get out there that didn't have question marks. So does Thibodeau have question marks? Sure. Do we need to see how his offense has evolved, philosophies evolved? Yes. Uh, I do think there's a little bit that's overblown about his running players into the ground. And I think there's another narrative out there that's extremely overblown in that the Knicks needed somebody that could develop talent and we're not sure if he could. Hey, this guy helped develop Jimmy Butler. This yeah. guy helped Among move others. Joakim Noah to a defensive player of the year. This They're guy first. coached the youngest MVP ever in the history of the league. So the notion that he hasn't developed talent or won't have the patience to develop talent, I will ask all the people, where is that coming from? Like, yeah. where, where, where is that narrative coming from? I just gave you three things that are fact and true that happened with the team in the first year that he took him over, right? And they were not projected to ever be as good as they were. I believe that was the 2011, 2010, 2011 Bulls projected as they were so where is the narrative that he can't develop talent just because he did it quickly and got them to a 60 win team doesn't mean that he didn't have a hand in developing that talent and i think jimmy butler is absolutely a perfect example of talent that he did develop so i mean like people just buy into narratives he's worn down players he might have long practices i have to believe that the man has learned something about that and adjusted to the league i understand he's from the riley's eric spolster school of having long practices eric spolster still has some longer practices OK, and nobody kills him for that. So let's cut. Ca let's calm down uh, mm -hmm. on, on that a little bit. I don't think it's a, is it a hire? I'm jumping for Joy Bryant. No. But do I think it's a solid hire? Yes. No, but if you're comparing resumes, which is what I love to compare in any walk of life, as you know, especially media. Uh, but if you're comparing resumes, Tom Thibodeau versus any other Nick coach since, I don't know, Jeff Van Gundy probably has the best resume. Yeah, right. So I, so I don't Better than. Better than Kurt Rambis, Derek Fisher coming in, Don yep. Chaney back in the day. You know, Mike what I'm Dantoni saying? when he came in. Mike Dantoni when he came in, even though he has a good resume now. Like at bare minimum, you're getting a proven winner, and not a proven winner in the Phil Jackson sense because he was doing a totally different job description that he, you know, got famous right. for. You know what I mean? Right. This is somebody who is a proven winning coach. Who, look, I think this is actually very good for R.J. Barrett. I think this could be. Very good or very bad for Kevin Knox. I hope well, it's I good for it's, Kevin Knox because I'm down on yeah, Kevin Knox. I think this is going to be good for R.J. Barrett, for Mitchell Robinson, and those kind of dudes. Like the Knicks fans love last year. They were saying that they wanted to see dogs on this team, play hard. You know, they got Bobby Portis. They got guys who, you know, were Julius Randle who were tough and this, this, and that. Now you have Tom Thibodeau. So if you have some of these dudes and you really want to develop these, this kind of team, if you're not going to win, just be annoying. That's what I say. All right? <laughs> like, if you're not going to win, just be a pain in the ass for I everyone mean, to get past. Because those Bulls teams, those Bulls teams, people forget. That Bulls teams, we, we thought at some point that they were championship contenders. Yes. Right? 
We thought at some point they were championship contenders. If it not for the Derrick Rose injury, who would have known what happened? We even thought in 2014, as recently as 2014, that Carmelo Anthony should have went there if he wanted to win a championship as opposed to staying with New York. And we know how that played out. Yeah. So there's a lot of what if there as it goes to the Chicago Bulls. And then you obviously have Jimmy Butler and Paul Gasol later on where they have a good team as well. Tom Thibodeau is a proven winner, and that's what you're getting. So I All like right. the hire. I like to hire. I agree yeah. with you for everything you said. The people were down on it. I just think there's some Nick fans you ain't never going to please them no matter what they do. The organization's actually made some decent moves in the last, uh, I'll say, month or so. Pretty much everything uh, that relates to actual management outside of the person who owns the team has been pretty good. So I'm really not upset with it. And I like... Thibodeau, I wanted a defensive-minded coach. We'll see how he evolves offensively. That's just me. I'm not getting stressed or making declarations or saying this is a bad move or this is that. We'll wait and see. Yeah. Could it be bad? Sure. Could it and be hopefully, good? And hopefully yeah. they draft the mellow ball because that's who I think they should get. I'm kind of I'm on that wave too. But we'll see. A lot has to do with what they can do in the draft and how they develop players. We'll, we'll see. So yeah. it is what it is. One time for your mind, one time. And one time for your mind, one time. One time for your mind. Uh, got some stuff real quick this week before we uh, get up out of here. Uh, I'll kick it off. I usually don't, but I'll kick off my one time for your mind this week. Uh, yeah. My one time for your mind sur- surrounds hip hop. Now, most of this year in hip hop, through the COVID pandemic, we have got a lot of EPs, not a lot of albums. Brian and I have been talking about this. We really haven't had that kind of great album to drop this year, but we have had some good EPs, including uh, Freddie Gibbs' uh, Alfredo which probably in terms of a project is my favorite project year. I know three years ago on this podcast, nobody ever thought they would hear me say a Freddie Gibbs project might be my favorite project year, but here we are. Things have changed. Um, that's a really good project. Um, we've had some other stuff that's come out. Joey Badass just put out a, a three song. He doesn't want me to call it EP, so I'm not going to do that to my Flatbush brother. Uh, it's a three song, so it's called The Light, the Light Pack. J. Cole just put out two songs, which both are mm. fire. The first and, um, one is a song of the year contender. Yeah, and the I'm second there. one's really good, and I really yeah. like it. And J. Cole just put out two joints that's fire, and he is just snapping, and I'm really excited for the fall off, which I think he'll drop some of the surprise somewhat later this year. I have no inside information on that, but that's just my thoughts. <laughs> Um, also makes you think, you know, Kendrick is coming. Uh, Black Thought is putting out an EP. At the time of this podcast, will be released at the end of this week. I'm very excited to hear that. But we did get a surprise announcement uh, the previous week about an album coming out. And it was kind of a surprise because uh, it was announced about a week before it dropped. And Logic dropped his what is being called his final album because he says he is retiring. It is called It was called No Pressure, released last Friday. Um, obviously a play off of his debut album, Under Pressure, um, which I, one thing I'll say about this album that I really actually liked, uh, Logic's first album, Under Pressure, he is in the basement of his Gaithersburg, Maryland home on the cover artwork, you know, writing with his friends in the studio. And in this one, No Pressure, it's the same thing of him in that studio and all the pieces of that from that first album have exploded. So whoever did the cover art, that was dope. Um... Logic retiring. Brian does not uh, believe a lot of rappers when they say they're going to retire. I tend to not either. We have seen this before as way too gimmicky throughout hip hop. If you're like maybe under 20 years old, you might buy this. I don't necessarily because we've seen we've seen this way and far too much. But on to the music uh, in terms of album. I was excited to finally be listening to a full LP. It was nice to finally listen to one. Logic uh, delivered what I thought was a good album, not a great album. I thought it had some weak spots on it and some tracks that were just absolutely corny. But the production was good, handled by Six, his longtime producer, No ID, also executive produced on this album. Logic raps a lot about, uh, you know, his time in the game, why he's getting out of the game, wants to focus on being a dad, which if that is true, that is more power to him and what he wants to do. And being a father, some of the messages on it became a little bit redundant. And him saying that, it's like, yo, we got it. You're retiring. Um, where I felt like he could have had a more celebration of the game, what Jay-Z did in his Black album when he was supposed to retire. Uh, so <laughs> I think that's something that could have been a little bit more diverse in content. Uh, yeah. But this was probably Logic's best work since his second album, uh, The Incredible True Story. Um, I think it was his best work since then. I think there's some argument it could be better than that project. But it's solid. It's a solid listen. You've got that. But with all that being said, we need some albums, man. Some full-length albums. J. Cole really got me excited for his. I'm excited for Joey Badass's album. But what I will, I am happy about in the last 
three weeks or so throughout July. July gave us some good hip hop music, and we should really be excited about that. I think it's been low, been lulls this year, but it gives me this feeling that maybe the fall is going to heat up, and we're going to start to get some full length albums, some really good projects, and hopefully people have been cooking up some really good music because of this interesting time we're living in uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic and everything that's been going on politically with Black Lives Matter. I'm really intrigued at the messages that could be coming in hip hop surrounding this from a lot of artists. So it's going to be really interesting to see. But like, if you want to check out the Logic album, no pressure, pretty good. Uh, I guess that sounded like a hip hop update, but that's your hip hop update from the Hard to Tell podcast. <laughs> Uh, I have a very short one time for your mind. Uh, there was a video posted by the New York Times' opinion page on Twitter, um, which I saw reposted by a bunch of people. I was one of those that reposted it this morning. Um, so basically what it was was the New York Times' opinion page put together this video, getting the reactions from a lot of people who are younger, I guess it would be fair to say millennials, and how they've handled COVID-19 here in America. And all of these people are from, like, you know, I think one's from Sudan, Jordan, New Zealand, uh, different parts of Europe all over the world. And, you know, they're in the in the video, they're playing, like, you know, uh, 45 and him saying that we're handling it the best and we're increasing testing. And then they're putting up all the data that obviously refutes everything he says. And then everyone from all over the world is sort of reacting to it in this taken aback, harsh way and just – you know, being very, very, I guess, disappointed slash impressed at how dumb America's been <laughs> during this whole time of the coronavirus pandemic. So it's a very interesting video. I encourage people to check it out. Uh, New York Times posted it. It is called, well, it is captioned rather, from testing to lockdowns, we shared the facts and figures of America's handling of the coronavirus with young people across the globe. Let's just say they were not impressed. The video is around six minutes long. Uh, in total, and it's funny. I'm gonna have well, to check. I'm gonna have to check that out. That sounds. Yeah. That sounds interesting. I would love to see the reactions of people around the world. I think I read something earlier this year in the pandemic about people's perceptions of American Americans and their attitudes toward handling the pandemic. And this is way early. This is back in like April. So this uh-huh. might be interesting to see that at this time. This could be pretty interesting. So I'll have to check that out. All right, that's it for episode 139 of the Ain't Hard to Sell podcast. If you take anything from this podcast, the motto should absolutely be, you need to have a plan because you might get punched in the face. If you got punched <laughs> in the face many times, like Roy Jones Jr., maybe you knocked out, maybe you should probably try to change things up. That just yeah. might be, be a suggestion. Uh, thank you to all our subscribers, all our people who are support us on Patreon. Please continue to subscribe to the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. Be sure to rate us. Leave a review. Check out our survey. Also, you can check out uh, how you can get a free connection uh, download with audio with Audible uh, to get an audio book. So definitely check that out as well, too. We're going to be protecting ourselves, quarantining, and not getting punched in the face. Word. For Brian Fonseca, I'm Dexter Henry. Until next time, y'all. Peace.